everybody and welcome to CDAC Awareness Week Eve. Oh, it all kicks off tomorrow. I'm Sarah, um, otherwise known as the Gluten Free Blogger. And today we have got a very exciting panel lined up. Now, it's not very often that you get two specialist dietitians and two veteran celiacs in the room to answer all of your questions. So tonight, very exciting. We're going to get everyone in just a second. So I've got Christian Costas, who's a celiac specialist dietitian. I've got Natalie Yala, who is a paediatric specialist dietitian. And I've got my good old pal and Old Crumbs podcast host, Laura Strange, who is a blogger and veteran celiac. So now I'm going to try and get everyone in and let's kick things off. If you've got any questions, put them in the comments box and we will ask them along the way. Just attempting to get everybody into the room. I don't know if it's working. I hope it's working. Oh, hello. Hi. Hey. <laughs> oh my hey, God, hi. it's working. Okay, we're just waiting for Laura. And then we're everybody's like, in the room. It's very exciting. <laughs> okay. So I'm just waiting for Laura to request to join. And then we will all be here. How are you guys? Really yeah. well, thank you. Are you? Yeah, good. Oh, hang on, Laura's just trying to get in. Let me see if I can let her in. Can't believe we're getting this technology working. Oh, this is amazing. Oh, don't, don't jinx it. I'm glad ah! it's you doing it. Hi, Laura. Hi, Laura. <laughs> Brilliant. So I've just explained to everyone that basically we're doing a Q&A session. If anybody's got questions, pop them in the box and I'll sort of try and field them as I go. But for now, do you guys just want to introduce yourselves to anyone who's watching this doesn't know who everyone is? So I'm Sarah. I run the Gluten Free Blogger. Um, but yeah, crack on. Who wants to go first? <laughs> you, you guys go for it. Do you, you want to go, Laura? Go on, Laura. Oh, I was pointing at Natalie, but yeah, I'll go first. Um, my name's Laura. My handle is my gluten free guide. Um, I've been a celiac for, well, diagnosed celiac for 23 years now. So hopefully you have some good pearls of wisdom to share. Brilliant. Hang How about you, Natalie? Natalie? <laughs> well, I'm Natalie. I'm a, a specialist dietitian. I work at Great Ormond Street Hospital with children, um, but I'm also a celiac and I also have three daughters who one of whom at the moment just one is also a celiac um, and lots of my family are also celiacs we're uh, like you're a bit of an odd uh, one out in my family if you're not a celiac so um so yeah hopefully i can help add some info or advice somewhere along those lines Brilliant. so yeah I'm, I'm i guess i'm the odd one out here with with all of you because i i don't actually have celiac disease uh, but i i love celiac disease working in the area um i work actually work with adults and um, specialize in celiac disease help people with a few other digestive conditions but i work both in the nhs uh, running a dietitian led service and a bit in private practice so helping people as much as i can in different ways and like natalie we're both involved in research too with celiac disease uh, we just can't get enough i think all four of us here we just generally can't can't get another, can we? <laughs> no, we're addicted. <laughs> okay, so I can see loads of questions coming in already. So we've got quite a few that have been sent in, so I'll kick off with some of those. Um, so we'll start around diagnosis, because obviously that's kind of a big issue. People have a lot of questions with that. So one of the questions that I've been asked is, what are the benefits of actually getting a celiac diagnosis? I know there's been a lot lately with people who perhaps aren't diagnosed and they've given up gluten or that they think they're intolerant. But I don't know, Christian, if you maybe want to start explaining what's so important about getting an actual diagnosis of celiac. Sure. Yeah. So, so I think it, it kind of goes back to first what celiac disease is. So, uh, so I hope most people are aware of it, but it's a lifelong autoimmune condition where gluten causes physical damage to the gut. And that's why I think, you know, that's why it's important to try and get that diagnosis really, because the whole thing with most things in medicine is, you know, if we, if we know what we're, you know, what the diagnosis is, we know what the treatment is and there's other gluten related conditions, which might be treated with the gluten free diet in different ways too. So I think getting that right, that diagnosis is important because then if we we know that we can treat it with the right gluten-free diet avoiding gluten to the right level and that can reduce the risk of complications for people long term and some can be you know a bit more serious complications it's not just the symptoms because of that physical damage
damage to the gut. But I think also it's knowing that you've got that diagnosis and, you know, for a lot of people it's going to be a relief to get that diagnosis, but also to have the right management plan long term, the right monitoring. We know that people with celiac disease can have persisting symptoms, other issues, there's other associated conditions with celiac disease. So it means that if you've got the right diagnosis, then you can, you know, go in the right direction with the right treatment and the right monitoring and follow up, which, you know, we'll be talking about a bit today. But I think it just sets everything to go in the right direction. And I, I think that that is key. I know that getting diagnosed and doing the gluten challenge is really difficult, but I really encourage people to, to consider it as much as possible. I mean, do you guys have anything to sort of add to that? Because obviously you're both diagnosed. So, oh, you know, you're so right, Christian. I, I was just thinking for me, it, I don't know, like all the people I've looked after on myself, I always think this word like identity always comes back to me. And I always think it just means so much to know who you are and what, why things are happening to you and what does it mean? How long is this going to last? Like, what does this mean for me? And, and I don't know, but just from a personal point of view, when that happened to me, I was like, oh, this all makes sense now. My, all my life, I, I've wondered what on earth has been wrong with me. Now I understand it. And so I think that just that relief, you know, even though you kind of, obviously there's all the, the practical things and the important medical things, but I think just mentally as well, just having that, awareness of who who you actually are and I think that really helped me definitely and all I would say as well is especially with CLF awareness week coming up and the big theme this year is identifying symptoms that aren't necessarily common for celiac disease but might be indicators of it if you feel like you have symptoms of celiac disease and perhaps your GP is saying nah they're not like the classic ones you've not got tummy pains go with your gut and really push for testing because so personally I started having symptoms when I was seven years old and didn't get diagnosed till I was 14 and the my particular GP didn't have expertise for celiac disease and I think as a patient you often just think oh doctors know everything but really that's there's a vast number of conditions medical conditions that they would have to know everything about so sometimes it does help to suggest that that's something that you think might be it or there might be family history of celiac disease really push for it especially I've heard from you know parents of children who've gone on to be diagnosed with celiacs who also struggled to get that initial testing done just be persistent and you know sometimes not always gps are incredibly knowledgeable and i'm not trying to you know sell them short in any way but yeah go with your gut feeling that's really interesting because actually the next question was somebody asking about like how do we get more awareness for gps and how do you kind of get them to take it seriously because i mean it's hard isn't it i mean i'm the same as you i i went to the gp over and over and they didn't know what it was and it was only when i saw a different gp that they were like oh maybe it's celiac and obviously you know we've both been celiac for like 20 years yeah, that was a long time ago same but, story <laughs> yeah people didn't really know what it was so i think that's kind of like i think your advice there to just be really persistent i mean do you have any other sort of tips if people are really struggling to get their gp to maybe take them seriously it's difficult isn't it you can always request to see another GP I mean ultimately Sarah and I that's what happened for mm -hmm. both of us my GP had holiday and another GP saw me immediately recognized the symptoms got me tested my I was like severely anemic like really really poorly and then it was just and I think Natalie alluded to this earlier then once you get that diagnosis it's a massive relief isn't it so um yeah it's hard sometimes to find your voice but be confident and really try and advocate for yourself Definitely. Yeah. yeah, go Natalie, what were you going to say? I was just going to say, I, you know, if it comes to it, I, you know, I have a sit-in in the GP's office and don't leave. <laughs> I think I've done that before. That's why I'm not, I'm not leaving. Like, this yeah. Is a, and yeah. Or sometimes I'll say to me, take, a, take a, the nice guidance, here's the link, you know, get it up on your phone. Yeah. And actually, often, if the GPs aren't quite knowledgeable about CLEPs, once you start showing them facts and yeah. guidance, this is what you should be doing, actually, they're sort of, oh, right, okay, yeah, all right, then maybe I, maybe I will do it. So, <laughs> you know, don't be shy, just, you, you might know more about it than they do. And that's always the key thing, just keep pushing, as you say, I think it's really yeah. important. Because on the other yeah. side as well, you have some professionals who are, you know, so I took my daughter and um, she'd been having tummy aches, so I took her to the GP and straight away he was like, I was prepared to have a, the battle because I'd heard from so many people who'd really struggled to get their children tested and my daughter doesn't have, you know, other symptoms, she's getting weight, she's growing well and anyway, uh, he was like, yeah, great, you're a first degree relative, we'll get you tested, so that was a nice 
other story to <laughs> your adrenaline yeah. dropped so in that moment yeah <laughs> that's actually Definitely. really yeah. sort of nice to use this one as well because the next question was about like if you have celiac disease at what point after you have a baby should you think about getting them tested? I mean, Natalie, have you got sort of any insight? Because obviously you're celiac and I think you said your kids are as well. So. Gosh, it, it, and it is. It's on your mind. Like from the men that I knew guys will know, you know, you as soon as you have your baby, have I passed that rubbish gene on to them? I'm really sorry. Um, and of course, when through weaning, now really the best time to, um, really the only time you can test them for celiac disease is once they've had gluten. So you're testing a new born baby they've not had any gluten they've not had exposure to gluten not enough through breast milk so right up until weaning is there's no need to test a newborn baby for celiac screening once they've started to have gluten there's always a chance that you know a baby really early on could develop celiac disease straight away and i've certainly seen that you know suddenly a baby that's thriving suddenly starts to falter in their growth and um, but but more often than not it's a few months after that if it's going to happen in those early years so but i would always you know if you've any suspicion of it and they're having gluten they've had it you know at least for six weeks then just go and ask the question to the gp it's you know it's and even if you just get that question out there and you get some reassurance back, it's always good to just check it out. But you have to have been eating gluten. Brilliant. And someone's actually asked us as well, um, like when you get, so obviously when you get tested for celiac, the first stage is a blood test, um, which tests for antibodies, which you have to be eating gluten. And the next stage is a biopsy. Um, and someone's messaged us saying, can you get false positives from um, a blood test they've been waiting for two years for a biopsy they're feeling a bit lost is that a thing Christian? <laughs> yes so you, you know this as crazy as it sounds it is a bit of a thing in terms of people waiting two years for a biopsy like it's not common to see but I have actually had people getting told right you know you've got a positive celiac blood antibody test so so you know with that I think you know just going back to basics with the whole diagnosis I'll, I'll link that in what happens is, yes, that's the first kind of point of call, right? So when you go to GP, that's the, the, the thing that most GPs can do is order this test, which is called an, an IgA TTG, immunoglobulin A tissue transglutaminase, a, full, a mouthful. Uh, but essentially what tends to happen is that, you know, as Natalie says, you have to be on a gluten-containing diet because we're looking for an abnormal response to gluten. And essentially, you know, these antibodies can raise, and they're quite specific for celiac disease. So, you know, actually these antibodies, they're quite accurate when it comes to diagnosis. You know, usually they're quite specific, but what can happen is, yes, sometimes they can be mild. If they're mildly elevated, sometimes there's other things that can mildly elevate them. It's not as, you know, it's rare to see it, but sometimes it can be. And that's why when they're very high, then that is very suggestive of celiac disease. So I think there's a big dif differentiation there. It's, you know, they're very high, then, then yes, that's quite strongly suggestive. Now, one of the things is that, you know, with children we've had for a long time, uh, and I'm sure Natalie can clarify it if needed, but essentially, children can get diagnosed if their body, the antibody is very high and there's another antibody level showing a certain level, uh, sort of certain value, they can be diagnosed without biopsy. We've had some, what we call interim or temporary guidance for adults where this can happen too. And it's kind of down to doctor's discretion. So in some centers now, what we're seeing is that some adults, you know, under the age of 55, they don't have any concerning symptoms that we think we need to investigate further. The antibody value is very high. And then they do another blood test called an EMA or an endomysial antibody if that's positive then some of these adults can be diagnosed with celiac disease without an endoscopy. But traditionally, all adults over the age of 18 would need this additional endoscopy, which just kind of gives more proof and, and you know, certifies the diagnosis and 100% for a lot of people. So the thing here is that, you know, people can wait between that initial blood test and then the endoscopy is a big waiting list for quite a few of those. So what I'd say to that person is, you know, really important to try to go back because it's a diagnostic procedure. You shouldn't really be waiting for two, for two years for a diagnostic procedure. So I would say definitely go back. Um, and and what, it, what it is, it's not to say the blood test is valid or not. It just depends on the values. It depends what's been done. It depends on your symptoms. It depends on quite a few other things. So I think it's really important to push for that, for it to happen earlier. I think it's, you know, it's always hard to give advice with these things. But, you know, if you do go on a gluten-free diet because you feel better, then I, we'd always recommend that actually going back on a gluten challenge to get that, that you know, that procedure done uh, and the proper diagnosis. But it's a really difficult one. Just wanted to acknowledge that. Yeah, there's loads of comments, actually, just to go back on what we've been talking about from people saying, um, 
because obviously with celiac awareness week the big thing is about these sort of hidden symptoms people don't know about and there's mm -hmm. lots of people in the comments someone said they were diagnosed with migraines um someone had diabetes and didn't know about it um someone there's lots of sort of questions about like what symptoms are celiac i mean off the top of your head i know there's a lot but what are some of perhaps the lesser known symptoms of celiac that you guys have perhaps experienced or come across Sure. Yeah, I'd say, you know, some of the, the interesting ones that people don't realize are, I'd, I'd say also, you know, with severity, like people don't realize uh, that you, they don't have to be very severe. So some people pr can present just with fatigue, you know, and they don't never think to go to the GP. And, uh, you know, some people can present with just headaches and a bit of fatigue and that's it. So I think really just to make people aware of that, that it doesn't have to be very severe. But I would say stuff like mouth ulcers, for example, loss of sensation of the fingers and toes. A lot of people don't associate with that with celiac disease vitamin and mineral deficiencies so many people see with like you know iron deficiency anemia for example that has just been checked and they get told take a take, take some iron and it's just a recurrent cycle for years so it's really important to get to the root cause why is someone anemic right um so so i'd say some of those but but yeah you know uh, the, the rest of you feel free to to chip in too yeah i mean it's so there's so many isn't there yeah. i think I've, I've, you know all the celiacs that i've ever met or, or children who are being worked up to have their diagnosis, they all come with a, even you know a different set of symptoms. And I think classically we think of children having this really classical presentation where they have the big pot belly and the little spindly malnourished arms. But actually, I think even though those children do present and they're almost really quickly diagnosed because they're so so clear, you know what's going on. Actually, the, most of the children I see have still had this difficult road because they've had maybe neurological symptoms, just headaches, sometimes behavioural things that they've actually tried to you know go down other avenues to find out and actually by chance they've just had a celiac test somewhere and so a real range and also um skin you know don't forget dermatitis hepatiformis and and lots of people say to you actually oh you can't get that in children and you definitely can i've seen it so many times so even in i've had a toddler with dermatitis hepatiformis once so you know it can happen so the, the symptoms are so far reaching and so different for everybody and as christian rightly says actually you can just have no symptoms at all and so that, and that's why we always talk about this testing of siblings testing of uh, first degree relatives because you just can be um, living with it and just not know or just so used to feeling a bit rubbish you know I don't know if anyone else yeah. Yeah. when you get that yeah, you know, oh, other people don't don't feel this rubbish all the time you know so actually you get so used to living with those symptoms I think people just think that's normal so really I would always have a low threshold to test for celiac mm. disease if there's any mm. of those far-ranging symptoms say one of my um daughter's classmates was diagnosed with celiac disease so he's four um and his his dad, but he tasted positive, so they tested the relatives, and his only symptom was that he was a really, really fussy eater. He was like thriving in terms of growth, completely fine, but so fussy with food, and his parents are like, okay, this all makes sense, you know, you've got the diagnosis, and that was great. Yeah. And I do wonder, actually, my son, he's two, and he's had some really really bad um, like eczema patches on his back and I think because of that I'm not and that haven't cleared up and we've seen a doctor about various things and I do wonder as well like now that what you just said Natalie about that maybe it's worth getting him tested already even though he is a severe chunk yeah, He's a, yeah, <laughs> he looks yeah. very healthy but you know it does make you think <laughs> Um, <laughs> well, should see of course him. it can be totally unrelated and it could be something else but but it's just hopefully yeah. Yeah. And you just, yeah yeah for sure for yeah. sure but yeah. first eating is, is yeah. classic you know i always say to families you know if your little one has had these symptoms for so long every time they've eaten they've had a tummy ache they've had yeah. you know bloating reflux pain sore throat you know from reflux that kind of thing just puts children off eating they've never had a positive experience of eating they don't associate appetite food with joy you know pleasure and actually, so they, they're bound to be fussy. They're bound to not really enjoy eating. And they have the really, you know, confident foods that they love and they trust, you know. And often they're the foods eaten in them. <laughs> so it never even goes that way around. But, but you know, children, fussy eating or, you know, food aversion, definitely, I would say. If, if Not always, of course, but I would have a low threshold for checking that out as a, just a first line when I see a patient like that. We, we even see it like.
like uh, at the extreme of things, like I've seen people misdiagnosed with an eating disorder too, right? Because they get so sick when they're eating gluten, then people think, oh, they just don't want to eat. They've got an eating disorder. I've yeah. seen that in quite a few cases, right? Yeah. So I think that's, again, it just goes back to what you were saying, Natalie, over to the extreme. And then, you know, what happens when people are, you know, they're, they're reacting in this way, not eating. People say, oh, I just have some plain toast. That's it. Well, you know, that's got loads of gluten in it. So, so we see that uh, quite a few times. I think it's important to highlight it. And it kind of goes back to what you were saying, Laura, doesn't it? You know, if you feel things aren't right, even if it's just slightly not right and you're off yourself, you know, we know celiac disease is also associated with anxiety, depression too. So mm. it's really important to talk about mental health in that way that, you know, it can affect so many different things. It's not just the gut, it's way beyond the gut. So all these things, really important to keep pushing and get to the root cause of it, whatever that, whatever that may be. Yeah. Someone's actually she commented saying that one of the reasons they were diagnosed was because they hated bread so there you go yeah. <laughs> I mean I think I remember as a child oh, not liking bread and sandwiches same. and stuff and then my think, oh, the bank yeah and I'm like oh maybe that's <laughs> why <laughs> um Natalie you mentioned briefly um and forgive my pronunciation um dermatitis herpiformis is that right um, yes. We've had quite a few questions about. I've been practicing that. Um, we've had quite a few questions about this, and I don't know if you got your question. Could maybe just explain a bit about what it is and like how it's related to celiac? Because I think there's quite a few people concerned that either they or their kids might have it, or they have celiac and then they've suddenly started developing skin problems. So yeah, could you maybe give a bit yeah. of an overview on that? Yeah. I mean I mean, it's a it's a really distinctive skin disorder and it's kind of I mean it, it always looks a little bit different on everybody so if you google the pictures of it and yours doesn't quite look like that doesn't always mean it's dermatitis epidermis but it, it's it's really classic it has this kind of deep red color and can have sort of like little blisters and they're often like little circles but the real characteristic of it is that it often comes in symmetrical patterns so you often get you know, two knees or two elbows, like it sort, of, sort of comes in a pattern like that tends to be. But often on the scalp, actually, even the little children I've looked after who've had it, have had it on their scalp. Or even when I did adults in the old days, you know, used to get scalp dermatitis epidermis. But the uh, probably the key thing to say about it is that when you when you go down that road and you think you've got that, you have, you have to have a biopsy, you know, through a dermatologist and you have to have that looked at properly under a microscope and make sure it is dermatitis dermatitis epidermis it's not an infection for example um, and then but what can happen you might get your diagnosis and you might think oh super I'm going to go on my gluten-free diet I'm going to be really brilliant and then it doesn't quite go away very quickly and that's always really disappointing because it's really itchy and horrible um, but so it's just to bear that in mind it can take a little while to go away and sometimes we can use medicines to help that a little bit as well um dapsone and different things so hopefully your team will know that and help you to get that that itch gone a little bit faster but it can it can persist a little bit after you've you know months even after you've gone gluten free it doesn't mean you're not doing well with your diet it just takes time to go away okay that's so interesting <laughs> sorry christian did you want to add anything yeah, no, definitely. I think that's spot on. Natalie, Natalie's a true expert in this area too. She's got so much knowledge about all these different things. And and I would just, um, all I'd say to that is that, you know, when we're talking about um, dermatitis herpetiformis, what happens is that a lot of people um, think, oh yeah, it's just a symptom of celiac disease. But what it is, is actually another autoimmune condition that reacts to gluten. So it's, it's a manifestation of the skin. But as Natalie was saying, you need a skin biopsy to diagnose the condition. So it's as strongly associated with celiac disease, but we do get some people that have dermatitis herpetiformis and don't have celiac disease too um, so so you know you can have both you can have dermatitis herpetiformis um, and celiac disease or potentially not but really with these autoimmune conditions where gluten's a trigger for all of them both say auto, uh, dermatitis herpetiformis and celiac disease we need to avoid gluten to the same degree really avoiding cross contact and everything to manage it but Natalie is saying you know it's frustrating for a lot of people with that dermatitis herpetiformis I see it in adults too it can take quite a while for for it to resolve you know whereas the celiac disease symptoms you know we tend to say within three months a lot of people get better they can take about up to a year you know within a few weeks people start to notice a difference but it, it might not be that quick that's really interesting actually because um, moving on to kind of like after diagnosis someone asked or quite a lot of people have asked actually like how long does it take to kind of recover once you've been diagnosed I mean Laura can you remember how long it took you to feel like normal if you ever felt normal <laughs> I don't know 
so long ago, but um, it was sort of tying in. Lots of people asking in the comments about anemia and iron mm. levels. And so how long I've been celiac now, so what, 23 years, and my iron levels, I've always struggled with them. So I don't know whether Natalie and Christian have any advice because for me, like every time I've gone through a pregnancy, like my iron has just like plummeted. I've always been on like the ferritin tablets and like, you know, it's you sort of just about get your iron levels back up and then they dip again. And I'm obviously like super careful with my diet. I would, because I get, I know when I've been gluten and it's very rare. So yeah, it would be interesting to know whether there's any advice mm. you have for people like me who may be struggling with anemia as like a persistent symptom, even after diagnosis and a careful gluten-free diet. Yeah, sure. That's, so I think we can, we can both share a bit there, but there's, there's some really interesting stuff with uh, iron deficiency, anemia and celiac disease. And we do see in some patients that despite a gluten-free diet, the celiac disease, even if the celiac disease is not active years down the line, they can still be anemic, right? So it doesn't happen to most people, but it almost, you know, once people get diagnosed with some people, it kind of can mess with that pathway of iron absorption long-term, right? So for some people, you know, even if they don't have active celiac disease, this can happen, but this all falls in, you know, with that follow up. That's why that individualized follow up is so important, because we will have people, you know, where we need to do further testing. We might want to repeat an endoscopy. We, we want to know, you know, for some people, they can have iron deficiency anemia further down the line. And it might not be linked to celiac disease. It might be a different medical condition. There might be a different reason, which is why we want to explore that. And sometimes we'll repeat an endoscopy to see, A, is celiac disease active or not? And then we can take things from there and know if, it, if the celiac disease is active, then we need to do stuff like check the gluten-free diet has been followed in the right way, that sort of thing. Or we might consider if, you know, if it's not active, do we need to do some other tests, you know, and there might be some other investigations, some other blood tests. So we can start to identify things a bit better. But, but yes, yeah, really interesting area and it's and it's you know no surprise that people are talking about it because it does happen brilliant and Natalie have you got anything to add I was just gonna add because iron always causes tummy trouble doesn't it so yeah. if, you know often you thought sort of, like yeah I'm anemic and oh you know especially in children and you always prescribe the same iron supplement on prescription that always gives you constipation and so often actually when you really when you really probe they said how often do you really take the eye and how actually it causes so many symptoms we don't take it every day and um, so in those situations and um, obviously every patient is different and probably an individual assessment would be needed but I, I would if a patient's come to me with that issue I would try and get an elemental iron supplement mm -hmm. so iron compound supplements and elemental iron supplements are two separate things and the compound iron supplements really they're the ones that cause the bit of havoc in the, in the GI tract and the elemental iron supplements are the ones where the iron's just free sort of swimming around and you just absorb it straight away so there sometimes you get those in sprays you might get those in water like sparto and that kind of thing um, so that can have less impact on the GI tract. It's really difficult to compare the doses and you can't really because the absorption rates are so different, but they tend to do a lot better and patients tend to take them better if they do find that the iron supplements are there, you know, are causing those symptoms. So ask your dietitian about that or your GP about that if, if you're struggling with that. Yeah, definitely. And I'd say, you know, a really, really good point, point there, Natalie. And I think, you know, what we, what I also see with adults is that I see adults prescribed iron three times a day too. And it's almost like a historic thing. But, you know, we've, we've had recent guidelines from the British Society of Gastroenterology suggesting that, you know, it's as effective, like things like ferrosulfate to take it once a day or every couple of days is as effective. So a lot of people, if they're taking three times a day, they'll just not take it. And that will make things worse because they, they get discomfort in the stomach or, you know, they get some these side effects so again kind of goes back to what we're saying again if something's not right rather than not take the medication go back to your gp go back to your doctor and you know by the same token on you know or the, the on the flip side of that what we'll see sometimes is people who they'll take all of this the, the oral iron and they'll still be anemic and some people end up needing um iron infusions right and this can happen too so i think it's always about going back if you're not responding if things aren't working and, and getting that right monitoring too brilliant and when it comes to kind of like monitoring after a diagnosis, um, we've had a few questions from people um, sent to us about like the annual blood tests and um, the fact that their levels of that very long antibody that I can't pronounce um, <laughs> are still really high, even though they're being really strict on a gluten-free diet. I mean, Christian, maybe you want to start like, why does that happen? What does that mean? You know, people are thinking they're doing everything right and they're still getting this blood test, tell them it's not 
perfect. Can yeah. you explain? <laughs> yeah, great. So I think the first thing I would say is that, you know, we should not look at things as black or white, right? So a lot of people look at that TTG testing as the, you know, gold standard tool for monitoring celiac disease. Whilst, yes, it is it, very useful, you know, what we see is that it depends on a few things. So sometimes, for example, someone might be newly diagnosed six months down the line, they do that TTG. And usually, you know, in most places, the range for a TTG, a normal one is going to be something between 0 and 7, 0 and 10, 0 and 15. Some people at diagnosis can be 2,000, 3,000 through the roof. And then at six months, they get tested and it's like, you know, 500 or 200. And they're like, why is it not down to zero? Well, you know, the TTG can take, you know, for some people even more than a year to normalize, right? So timing is really important. A lot of people, they get desperate because they don't see that, that number normalized. And so it's really important to understand timing. And that's going to be different for each person. And then the other thing I would say is that a lot of times if it's elevated, it can be, you know, long term, someone who's been on a gluten free diet for quite a long time, quite a few years, it can be suggestive um, that there's still gluten in the diet. Not always, right? But it can be suggestive of it. And that's why, again, we have to investigate things further. And a lot of people don't get access to a dietitian. So we can go and usually a dietitian uh, who's well versed in celiac disease can go through things and there might be stuff that you're missing because you just never get educated with a lot of people who get the whole, you know, diet sheet when they're diagnosed and off they go to figure out or go to Google. So most people don't get well educated with it. So a lot of times there is gluten in people's diet without realizing. But I think that's why it's, again, that individualized follow-up and we can make sure. And then, you know, there's sometimes situations where the antibodies can be elevated, but when we go in with an endoscopy and do uh, and repeat some of these biopsies, they can be normal. And the, on the flip side too, you know, when we turn that around, sometimes people come and they're like, oh, my antibody's negative and they're still eating gluten without realizing it, you know, and when we go in with the endoscopy, we can see it's active. So what I'm trying to say is that there's no one test that works 100% of the times, 100% accurate. We need to look at the full picture. That's why that individualized monitoring and having, you know, a doctor and a dietitian. And if you're going to doctor, you know, some of these cases where it's more complex, a gastroenterologist who's well-versed in celiac disease can really help to interpret all of this. Because as we were saying, I think GPs don't always, they don't get trained with all of this. They're not specialists with celiac disease. So, so sometimes it's, you know, it's, it can be frustrating, but a lot of times they're not as well versed. So sometimes it's good to ask for that referral to a specialist if you're getting stuck. Definitely. And I think like as well, it's interesting because there's been a lot of questions about annual checkups. So for me, I was diagnosed like 20 years ago. Um, and then I never, ever, ever had a follow-up appointment. I had a dietitian appointment when I was diagnosed. So given all my free sample boxes from like gl glutathione and javella and sent on my merry way to deal with life and then suddenly about five years ago a letter turned up from my gp saying we're inviting you for your annual checkup and i was like sorry what <laughs> um oh and ever God. since then and on the dot every year i get invited for a blood test they do my bmi they do like this time i'm even going in to see a nurse get my blood pressure done and i'm like this is weird and i put it out on facebook and everyone you know, half the internet's like, what is this? I've never had it. And half of the internet's getting a checkup every year. Um, Laura and Natalie, as celiacs, what's your experience in follow-up? I'm so interested to know because it seems to be a complete postcode lottery as to what you get and what you should get. <laughs> yeah, so I, I never have had one. And I've tried to have one before. And the GP was like, uh, I don't know. So I think I need to follow Natalie's earlier advice. It goes to the GP and be like, check me out make sure i'm okay because yeah i i put the chair <laughs> um because it makes a lot of sense as well you want to make sure that you're not that you're doing things right and your body is recovering well and especially someone like me you know i just spoke about how my iron is always really dodgy yeah and clearly should sort myself out and yeah um follow my own advice from earlier but uh, natalie i feel like, like you must have an annual checkup <laughs> As a, oh, and also, Natalie, a couple of people. <laughs> so I was just going to say, a couple of people wanted to comments that your microphone is a little bit quiet. So oh, yeah. Come closer to it more than anything. Oh, is that me? You might just have to shout, Natalie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, sorry, I'll go closer. Um, no, and because I, I moved around so much, I think that I've sort of lost myself in my own in, the, in my own system. So I don't. And actually, uh, the last GP that I did go to and chat about it, he decided that I knew more about it than than he did. So he was a bit like, you know, I think it's all right. Um, so, but yes, and, and my daughter especially, that like I sort of 
we don't get offered anything like annually but I, I sort of ring up and say hi me they probably roll their eyes every time that I, it's me on the phone but yeah that I'd make sure that she gets um the annual checkups and things that she needs for sure um, but it's but it's difficult and every time I've moved every every different part of England that I've lived in has a different setup and a different idea of what's normal and what's their sister. My sister has celiac disease, she lives in Yorkshire and it was only that like last year we were chatting and she said do you know what I, I don't really have any checkups either so I think it just totally depends where you live and what the system is and whether you've got a bit lost to the system but definitely go back and ask you know and, and particularly if you're worried you know if you've got some symptoms that you're worried about often people still have symptoms even though their um, antibodies are fine and they're following the diet really well we often see that don't we Christian I think that's probably what our our, our service is really is helping people to co recover those extra symptoms that don't seem to always go away so if you've got those and you're still worried you know keep just keep going back and, and pushing the door shut with the chair and asking for some help <laughs> I feel like Definitely. Kristen you've got like the gold standard because you kind of head up this specialist like dietitian unit I mean I feel like Leeds is the place to live right if you've got celiac tell us more about what you <laughs> do because that seems to be what everyone else should be doing right <laughs> yeah that's that's what we're trying so so yeah I live in Leeds but the the hospital I work in is in Bradford where we're running this service and and essentially um yes what we've got we've been very lucky there's few diets you know services like this but we actually got funding we were able to prove that you know it saves money for the NHS reduces gastroenterologist input but it's a dietitian led celiac service and essentially uh, myself as a dietitian I'm in charge of monitoring patients rather than it being a doctor but if there's more medical issues we can refer to gastroenterologists or we might sit in clinic together or we work collaboratively so it's almost kind of swapping around but there's still that medical input where needed which means patients get more opportunities to see a dietitian and I specialize in celiac disease too and I think that's another key thing we see many services where you know there might be a lot of dietitians around but not many are that well versed in celiac disease and I think there then there's limitations as to how much dietitians can help patients so I think that's a really important aspect of our um, of our service too and what we do is essentially that's it with the certain patients that come in we'll offer them an annual follow-up long term uh, we do some things like you know using virtual questionnaires for patients that are a bit more stable that sort of thing but you know we get a lot as natalie was saying a lot of patients come back with persisting symptoms they might have ibs and celiac disease they might develop other conditions we know that with celiac disease you know there's an increased risk of developing other autoimmune conditions so they might develop another one potentially so that monitoring is really important and and then we can also you know because it's run by dietitians then we can go through diet a bit more with patients help them optimize things and really you know the the whole annual checkup thing is you know it's some it's something that is part of our national guidance from the british society of gastroenterology and, and our nice guidance i think the whole challenge is that you know the nhs isn't properly funded to provide everyone with celiac disease an annual review and i think you know th this is why we need to push for these sorts of funding opportunities i think which are a bit different a different slant where it's cheaper potentially to have a dietitian but that's well versed and that's how we can support these because i think it's not realistic for all gps to do annual reviews for everyone but having said that you know that's national guidance and i think as nasty was saying you know it's important that if you if you wanted to get that support you want to run it through then you know that is there that's the guidance and you can ask for that support uh, but yeah i'll continue to do my bit to try and uh, get these clinics running because they're very cost effective that's what a lot of my work is showing really we're um, trying to get data published all this sort of thing but really it's it's a win-win for everyone i think you know we've got happy patients patients we've got the doctors the way they can prioritize uh, more critical patients but still get involved when needed and uh, and you know as, as dietitians we feel very rewarded because we're all helping people as much as we can it's just such a cool model and i think like there's someone asking hmm. in the comments well it looks like christian you've been invited to kent um to set one up there i asked him before all of you <laughs> um and also someone else has asked about like they work as a nurse and like how can they set that that sort of thing up where they are in cornwall so presumably if someone's got a question like that perhaps they could send you a message and kind of ask you that yeah. Definitely. Uh, feel free to send me a message. So we, we've got about like, I would, I think it's roughly around 10 dietitian led services uh, like this around the country. So there's not many compared with all the services, but mm. that's what I'm trying to do really is, is share this data with people. And I've done that with a lot of services. So feel free to drop me a message and I'll send you across some stuff, some of our data, all that sort of thing, because I think it's all about helping people realize this, that, that, you know, the, there's a big problem, but there's, there's some solutions there too that, that can help, you know, for, for a lot. So definitely happy to share that.
Brilliant. And taking a bit of a segue now, I've just noticed in the comments, there's quite a lot of questions which I thought would be interesting to touch on about celiac disease and pregnancy and fertility. A lot of people um, saying that they are not sure like how it affects that. Does it affect fertility? I know that's one of the sort of big things that Celiac UK is pushing that perhaps like recurrent miscarriages can be a symptom of celiac. I mean, do you guys perhaps have any sort of light to shed on that? Definitely, yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd say yeah, I I see it with with patients, and it, and it is we've got research to back it, and we see problems with fertility, recurrent miscarriages too, and a lot of people don't realize this. This is you know one of the ones again when we're talking about the you know less common presentations of celiac disease. That's one, and I think we just don't have you know there's so many, but I I think it's really important to highlight that one. You know, uh, I did a collaborative post. I think it was a couple of weeks ago with a fertility dietitian, and it's amazing. Amazing, the amount of comments people po posting on there realizing that you know they finally got pregnant after they had the celiac disease diagnosis too and and you know it, it's something that people don't uh, don't really associate and many doctors won't which is why again sometimes it's good to give that nudge and that's why I'd always I'd also add that you know on on the celiac UK website you've got is it celiac disease or UK mm. so you can actually fill in a self-assessment questionnaire which will ask you about certain symptoms and it'll, it, you know it'll, it'll mention some of these and then you can take that to your GP too. So I think that also helps without it being one side against another. You've got some objective evidence that can help with all of that. But yeah, some you know some of the things that people don't realize is that these absorption issues that some people can have with celiac disease, it can affect things like folic acid too, or the vitamins and minerals that are important for pregnancy. Sometimes those raised antibodies too can interfere with the pregnancy itself too. So there's many different reasons we don't know for sure, but there's definitely an association that we see there. Yeah, because mm -hmm when I was pregnant I had to have a higher dose of folic acid um, because I'm celiac and I think that's something that I, I think my GP was pretty good at flagging that up but I'm, I've spoken to about it before on Instagram and people are like oh I didn't know and they panic and firstly if you're pregnant and you're not on a higher dose of folic acid or celiac don't panic it'll you'll be fine mm -hmm. but speak to your GP because you are eligible to get one and it has to be prescribed because the level it is is much higher yeah, than the ones you buy five milligrams right yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Definitely. Okay, so moving on to the next question. We've got so many still to get through, and I'm like, oh, there's so much information. Um, <laughs> <It's all cold>. <laughs> <laughs> so, Maybe we need round two of this in the future. <laughs> yeah, we might not get through everything, but obviously, like, you, anyone can message us if they have any specific questions that we don't get to cover. Um, so, talking about sort of when you are obviously going on a gluten free diet. Obviously, we all have those moments where you eat something and you think, oh, no, that had gluten in. I don't feel good. What would be your top tips sort of for when you get glutened and how do you cope with that? Because obviously there's nothing you can do. You've been glutened, but how can you ease those symptoms? Laura, had you have any sort of tips for how you... Um, <laughs> a lot of rest because for me, I'll get like the, like the worst stomach pain straight away. So I tend to like hit the painkillers, have some paracetamol, have a, a lot of water I find really mm. helps and then just rest and like curl up in a ball and just feel sorry for yourself for a bit that's okay get a hot water bottle on your tummy if it's feeling really achy things like peppermint tea can help and I know it sucks but you've just got to wait it out and for me personally I tend to it wipes me out for a good week like the tiredness really hits me so just like a bit of TRC just go easy on yourself and Natalie, have you got any tips when you get accidentally oh, glutened? Yeah. Oh, you know, it's one of those things, isn't it? I even did it to myself like a couple of months ago where I was eating something that I, you know, a graze box, those little oh. graze snacks. And I thought, oh, you've eaten them all the time. I thought it was the same one. And the bit of the box had just curled around the corner and I sort of checked it and I thought, oh, yeah, and it's that. And straight away, I was like, oh, something's oh, not going oh. in my mouth. It goes oh. a bit funny. And then I and the bit of bent cardboard I sort of took back up and I said, it just said wheat on it. And, and you know, apart from the medical things that happen, I think it's the mental things that happen mm. to me. I get I get this rush of a total anxiety, and I don't know if that happens to everybody. But I said, mm. oh my gosh, I'm too I'm too busy. I've not got time to be gluten. You know, like, yeah. oh my god, I've got children <laughs> to look after. I don't know. Oh. So I get this real rush of anxiety actually, and, I, and it's taken me a lot of years. I think to to, to try and really calm myself 
down if I'm out in a restaurant yeah. or something and I, you know that awful feeling where someone walks over that that's happened to me and the waiters walked over with this oh. white look on their face and they realize they've given you something and you think oh no you know and actually I think some of my initial symptoms after my after in those early years was that my heart was beating and you know and actually it's taken me a while to just take some deep breaths and it's going to be okay like I'm, I'm not going to die you know I'm going to be okay I'm safe I'm with people that I love and you know and so I think the, the mental things, I think, were the things that get me the most. And then just, but, you know, as you say, everybody's different. And that's really important. And I know that's what we've been going to be talking about a lot this week. But that what happens to me, other people might get eat gluten and not really know, or might know the next day, might have tummy, might have diarrhea the next day. Some people have profuse vomiting, you know, and actually need to be hospitalized when this happens. So everybody is so different. But I think the biggest thing for me is not to feel guilty. Mm. not to go over and over and over in your mind oh what have I done to such an idiot you know that's what I always think of um and just to try and keep calm and then just you know t- as as Laura says just ride it out you know mm. it's going to get better and you you know you know it's going to ease up over time but it's it's really hard isn't it it's it never gets easier I don't I don't no. think no it doesn't and it's so interesting as well because I find that like as well as saying everybody's different like I find my symptoms sometimes are different so like sometimes I'll get a really bad stomach ache and I'll, you know, it might be a, a day or so later. And then sometimes within an hour, I'm like, oh my God, I'm definitely eating gluten. And then sometimes I just get like the worst brain fog, which I don't think I ever had sort of pre-diagnosis, but now it's like, I just literally cannot form a thought in my head. And I just have to lie on the sofa with peppermint tea and be like, that's it for me for two days. I'm gone. Um, and it's weird how even like the symptoms you have yourself are different each time. Totally. I found when I was pregnant, I, I got accidentally gluten by a restaurant and they came, there was a classic, they were like, we're really sorry. And I was like, okay. We have to go home. I had a little reaction. We know how much you're pregnant. And it was the weirdest thing. And I was, I was waiting for, and I had no reaction. And I was like, okay, I know I've been gluten, but, and then uh, like, months and months later when after I had my baby and I got gluten it was awful I had like a mind it was I you know when you're like I'm gonna die oh. being very dramatic oh. about it but I had like a migraine which I'd never had before and so like you say Sarah it can really evolve mm. and swing and yeah I think also for people who don't have symptoms in, of you know when they get gluten it can be very tempting for them to be like eh, whatever I don't need to be gluten free but I think you've really got to bear in mind the like the long-term damage that could be being caused if you do keep eating gluten mm. i know it's tempting if you're like well it's fine i'll just snap a croissant here and there like you're really gonna it, there's a lot of dangerous symptoms if you have a look on the select uk website there's more details and i don't want to scare anyone or anything like that but mainly just to stress how serious it is to really be strictly gluten-free when you are celiac definitely yeah and, and impacts them you know well i think a lot of people don't realize it's like oh they don't have symptoms but it impacts many other areas of the body so this is where we see things like lower bone mineral density some people it can manifest like that you know some people are like they say to me well i have no symptoms and then we look at a blood test and they're anemic and like well yeah it's just that you don't have digestive symptoms but you know you're probably you're not absorbing too so there's there's all these things that can affect your immune system too so uh, a lot of people don't realize all of that and that's why it comes back to that first question yeah me sarah right why why get the diagnosis in the first place mm-hmm. well because once you've got the diagnosis you know right this is your roadmap to get better and to get your overall health better not just your gut and that's why with a lot of research and our experience natalie too you know we always say as to patients that the symptoms are the worst predictor of how your gut is doing from a celiac disease point of view because as we've all said they're variable sometimes you might not get them it changes so you know people that say sometimes oh you know i can I tolerate this because I don't have symptoms then that's just never a good predictor and 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 that's not never a good indicator really yeah for sure okay. and, and just to add in, in pediatrics obviously we I look after children with allergy mm. as well and, mm. and so it's, it's really important to determine whether a child has like a non-IGE mediated allergy to weeds mm. or celiac disease because it might with celiac disease you have lifelong strict ever so strict restriction of gluten whereas a non-IGE mediated allergy to wheat actually you might at some point want to try and introduce a little bit of we and see if we can tolerate that you know build it so the distinction made with that diagnosis for children and with those kinds of problems i think is almost crucial really for that long-term knowledge of how to manage them Mm. definitely 
Um, we've had an interesting question come in as well. Um, someone said, I'm, how concerned should celiac be with calcium consumption? Is it feasible to get enough through the diet alone? Now, I know um, there's a lot of information about how things like bread normally has a lot of calcium in, but obviously the bread that we buy gluten-free is not sort of fortified with that stuff. Christian's smiling because we've had a lot of conversations about this before. Um, do you perhaps want to give a bit of an overview about calcium on a gluten-free diet and what we as celiacs should be doing? Yeah, sure. I think it'll be good because I can talk about adults and then Natalie can talk about uh, children too. Yeah. So, so you, you know, with celiac disease, you know, once you have a diagnosis of celiac disease, you actually have an increased calcium requirement. So that's really important. That's the first thing we need to consider. So for adults, what, you know, what adults should be getting is a thousand milligrams of calcium. So one of the main reasons is because we know that, you know, celiac disease is associated with lower bone mineral density in, in some cases, uh, which is why it was good to speak. You know, I know some comments people have mentioned things about DEXA scans where we can you know we can check the the bone mineral density that someone has in comparison with what they should have for the for the age uh, but but really you know that's one of the things that we can do to monitor it and I'd say you know if you're wondering about that definitely speak to your doctor about it but one of the things regardless is that people should be getting a thousand milligrams of calcium and you can actually do that through diets right so some I think there's another question asking you know uh, can I just take it from diet rather than supplement in most cases you can but you know I, I don't know about an individual person there might be a reason why they're taking calcium too but in most cases yes you can get a thousand milligrams through diet and actually that's a really good exercise to do because if you focus on some uh, animal sources you have them uh, and also some plant sources then they'll give you some other vitamins minerals some fiber from the plant sources too so it's a good way of diversifying the diet um so yeah definitely increase calcium requirement and a thousand milligrams for adults i'd say and what Sorry to jump in. I'm, yeah. I'm just thinking. So I was diagnosed when I was 14. And my mum was diagnosed when she was 50. And for her, unfortunately, she's got some mild osteoporosis as a result of being undiagnosed for so many sure. years. And so she does have to take calcium, whereas I don't, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. And do you think is it often sort of age dependent? Like when you were diagnosed, if you're diagnosed when you're young, the risks are lower that you're going to develop any bone density issues or if you're diagnosed when you're older perhaps then is when you need to be more mindful of, or you should speak to your doctor about having that calcium supplement yeah great great question laura so yeah i would say definitely what we see is people who get older because there's other factors that affect bone mineral density and aging is one of them the, there's other things like for example smoking alcohol too that can make it weaker there's you know if you've got very low weight too there's quite a few right so what we say is yes you know when you get older then then we naturally see a decline but some people also i think the whole thing is if you you can have osteoporosis younger too and sometimes it can be because of celiac disease right where you've got significant malabsorption don't get enough calcium and vitamin D so really what uh, and you know there was another question earlier saying how often should I get repeat DEXA scan that really depends on the original uh, result of the scan so for some people when it's normal we might wait five ten years to repeat it but if someone's got diagnosed osteoporosis we want to keep an eye on that and then people with diagnosed osteoporosis tend to have calcium and vitamin D treatment and they might have what we call bisphosphonates too which can actually strengthen the bones so they might have specific treatment for that monitoring and then we might repeat that bone scan after two three years again depends on the person right but it's a bit more of intense monitoring that way so yes i'd say it depends on the severity of what we see with that bone scan too and also patient preference some people might not be getting enough calcium in their diet they might have other challenges other issues so that's why it's it's a bit individualized but i'd say most people you know it's not too advanced they could probably do it through diets too and and then just see how things go and speak to your doctor and and dietitian yeah, and Natalie, do you want to kind of explain a little bit on the calcium side for kids as yeah. well? Is it any different? Sure. Yeah, thanks, Christian. And, uh, so really, children, it's just different. So every age of child development, calcium requirements kind of go a little bit like this. Like, so they're, they, they're actually quite low at some points. And then the most, the highest peak of calcium requirements is like growth spurt so often like the teenage years is when they're really really high and um, so as a dietitian that's always one of my little things that I've got in my check this box you know are they meeting their requirements for their age of the person that I'm seeing um, but for, so for, absolutely for sure as Christian says I would always try and get that in through diet and actually in children I find generally that is actually well met you know if they if they're drinking milk or milk substitute that's fortified with calcium we, we can easily get there um, and then for whatever reason if there's a child that you know 
potentially doesn't meet their calcium requirements. Very rarely do I get them a calcium supplement. So it's, it's sort of on the probably slightly other end of the spectrum from the later end of life. We also know that once you're on a diet and you, if you adhere to the diet well and you've got the villi, uh, you know, healthy again, and you're absorbing all of your nutrients again, actually your bone mineral density can, can return to normal. So in children, that's a little bit, I think maybe a little bit easier than if you've had 30 years of malabsorption. So it's, there's definitely differences, um, but, but it's always important to make sure you've got that calcium. I've done, I've got a little post on my grid actually, of, do you need a calcium supplement in children with seed disease? And it's got a little thing of what your requirements are at what age. So if that's helpful to anyone, have a little look at that as well. Oh, that's brilliant. And actually someone's pet as well, which I think is quite an interesting thing. Cause we've talked a lot about like, you know, all these other conditions and other problems that are associated with celiac. But someone said, so if someone has celiac and they manage it properly, can they be perfectly healthy in terms of fertility and osteoporosis? And I think it's probably important to say, like, you can be healthy, like, if you're managing your celiac well, you know, just because it's talked about with things like miscarriages and osteoporosis, a lot of that is when you are not sticking to a strict gluten-free diet or you're undiagnosed. But actually, if you're following a gluten free diet you can live a perfectly happy healthy life right <laughs> definitely 100 percent. for most people that's that's going to be the case because as i'm saying the, the good thing is that the damage isn't permanent to the gut and it can actually heal and go back to normal it can take about two to five years you know depending on the person but it can go back to normal that's a good thing if gluten's kept out of the diet a lot of people uh, you know can not have complications and, and do pretty well brilliant now, I'm just going to ask like one or two more questions because I'm conscious we've been going nearly an hour and I think you guys have been amazing watching this. I feel like we could chat all day, um, but we might lose a few people along the way. Um, so one of the questions that's come up a few times, um, and I'm going to fire this one at Laura because she is the expert, is about traveling with celiac disease. Now, if you haven't seen Laura's website, it's got so many amazing travel guides. I basically plan all my trips around her travel guides and all the places I can eat. Um, but Laura, do you have any top tips for someone who is looking to go on holiday or travel? Because obviously it's one thing learning to cook for yourself at home, but it's a whole other thing trying to do it with language barriers and different cuisines, yeah. isn't it? Well, first thing, so I've got loads on my website, which um, if you click on my click on my name, you'll find my website quite easily through there. You should also follow uh, Rachel. Her handle is mm. the Sightseeing Celiac. She... <laughs> There's so much amazing information and her account is purely about travel. Um, there's some other wonderful people as well, but like Rachel, I really trust her guide. She's mm. also celiac, very strict in her criteria. Um, but yeah, so when you go away, firstly, like travel is not out of bounds to celiacs. You can still go, you can still have a wonderful time. You do need to do a bit of research and pre-planning because some countries are great for celiacs, like Italy, others like France, not so much. Um, but really don't let your celiac disease hold you back just be prepared to put in a bit of pre-graft and research to identify maybe a resort that's a good place for you to go some restaurants that you might want to aim to eat at get yourself um, a celiac language card in whichever country language you're going to they're all readily available on the internet and free you can just download them print them off and it will really help you when you're feeling a bit nervous in a restaurant in Spain and you don't speak any Spanish and then you can give them this card and, and I find people are really lovely and helpful. Like I've travelled all over the place in the celiac. We went to Indonesia for our honeymoon. We were in some random village in the middle of a jungle and the people there were so, so kind and helpful and they made me safe food and I wasn't poorly at all. Sometimes you just have to have faith in the fact that there are really good humans out there and also trust your gut in that some places aren't so good. So, you know, it can be done. It takes a bit of time and patience and experience, but you know, don't think it's out of bounds for you now just because you're celiac. I think that's such good advice because it is like, you can make it happen. You just maybe perhaps lose, unless you're very lucky, you lose like being spontaneous about just rocking up somewhere and hoping you can eat. And I know a lot of countries are sort of getting better um, in terms of like their understanding but yeah I mean I've done quite a bit of travel as well I've been to like Africa a lot and it's always been great um, and you know awareness is only getting better there as it gets better here and I think the same advice kind of goes when you're eating out in restaurants as well um, trust your gut I think is probably the best to take away from that um, when it's not so just, gluten yeah exactly <laughs> yeah, don't, then just run and hide <laughs> So I think like we might have to kind of 
yeah, start to wind things down a bit now. But I wanted to kind of end this on a positive for Celiac Awareness Week and ask each of you what your pearl of wisdom would be for anyone who's on a gluten-free diet or newly diagnosed and feeling a little bit lost. Who wants to start? <laughs> um, Silence. I, yeah. um, I'm, I'm happy to go and say, go I on, guess, Christy. like... Um, yeah, I'd say, I'd say um, I, and a bit what I've taken from everyone today too, I think the, the key thing, and then seeing what you both do, Sarah and Laura, I think it's, you know, really about digging deeper. I think, you know, a lot of people stay at that superficial level with the knowledge that they get given by a doctor, the knowledge they see online, all that sort of stuff. And, you know, you two have mastered gluten-free cooking. People, a lot, I see a lot of people struggling. And actually it's like, you put that groundwork in, in the kitchen, asking the questions when you eat out, you know, checking your food labels, spending some more time in the supermarket. And you start to see the positives, you start to see, you know, all the stuff you can eat, all the things you can enjoy. And I think that's really the key thing. It's kind of going deeper and trying to, you know, continue to pursue things speak to another doctor try to get see a specialist to all that sort of stuff and and it kind of was linked to, to another question someone asked about you know uh can i have can there be negative tests for celiac disease like the anti you know with the antibodies and yes there can right there's no perfect test and that's why you know it depends how that's done same as the endoscopy we can have a false positive the endoscopy isn't done the right way so all these things it all goes back to there's no one thing that works all the time same with everything, same with gluten-free cooking, same with everything. So you just got to keep digging deeper, get the right information, use the support from the community. So, uh, yeah, that's what I'd say. Just keep keep going at it and you'll, you'll get there. Who wants to get oh, I, next? Um, <laughs> Laura, so go I was on. just going to say, so sometimes it can suck being celiac, let's be honest. Sometimes you're there and you're like, oh, I feel really miserable about it. But ultimately, I always think back to how poorly I was before I was diagnosed and how much that sucked I would much rather be a diagnosed celiac than that be in that weird state where I didn't know why I was poorly feeling frustrated and having no energy and ultimately my diagnosis is probably one of the best things that ever happened because I got back to being me again I got energy again I got strong and healthy I now have two children I you know it's life is really good thanks to that diagnosis and it does take some management, but with experience, it gets much easier. And um, there's a really nice online community as well. So there's always people to ask. I think if anyone's questions haven't been answered today, like mm. message any of us. We're all lovely and friendly and all willing to, like, you know, happy to hear from other celiacs and answer any questions people have. Definitely. What about you, Natalie? Oh, well, well said, everyone. I, I mean, the same things. You know, I would. I would say the community, you know, and I think sometimes when you get a diagnosis of celiac disease, especially if no one in your family has got that, you've not don't know anyone with it, it can feel really overwhelming and isolating, and you can suddenly feel like oh, I can't go anywhere, my friends aren't going to understand, or what if I get gluten? It just is a quite an overwhelming experience, and I think um, even for parents of children who are diagnosed, that is the same. You know, suddenly there's this overwhelming need to protect their children, understand everything, suddenly this new thing. And I think what really can help is, the, is this community that we're, we're part of, and it's helped me personally as well. And also Celiac UK, of course, and probably the first thing I say, I always say to my patients, if you don't listen to anything I say, just you know, go and find Celiac UK website because everything on there you can just trust with with a hundred percent and I think there's not there's not huge amounts of places that you can do that so mm. Celiac UK the community that I've found on Instagram and, and social media just to feel part of something and we're talking about traveling you know that really helps I remember when we went to Disneyland with my children and I found like a Disney Disneyland Facebook Disneyland GF group or something and I think I just read it for like four weeks before we went and I was like oh, so valuable people had put maps on where to go wow. to the green ground to get the chip. But, it, but it was a game changer you know so the community is about is everything um but I I was thinking you know don't be too hard on yourself you know it's really tough it's overwhelming amount of medical information dietary information and you're not in a well place when you're finding all of this out, you know, so it's mm. really, don't be too hard on yourself. You get, you get really good at it, over, you know, and you do become an expert and it does get easier. It does. Oh, those are such good tips. And I think, yeah, I would just echo that and just say like, you have to try and frame it in a positive way if you can. So instead of thinking, 
oh my gosh, there's all this food I can't eat. You're like, right, what can I eat? Like, I've got this whole new aisle in the supermarket that I've never been to before, the free from aisle. And like, you know, oh my God, I can't have donuts. Oh, but as I have these frozen donuts, you know, try everything, enjoy it, get everyone on board. You get to pick the restaurants all the time. Like, come on, you, you're living your best life. You've got to try and like, look at it in that way. Um, guys, this has been amazing. I really hope we can do this again soon. Um, for everyone who's asking, yes, it will be saved pending my technical capabilities. So <laughs> everyone should be able to watch it back if you just joined us or you missed it. Um, but for anyone who has joined or has been watching along the way, can you guys just remind everybody where they can find you on the internet, please? I don't know if you want to start, Christian, Laura, Natalie, go around like that. <laughs> sure, yeah. So so through here, most of the stuff I'll share is uh, through here on Instagram at Celiac Dietitian. Uh, I do a bit on Twitter too um, and stuff, but I'd say mainly through here really is where, where you're going to find me. Cool. You can find me on here at my gluten-free guide, or one word, or my website is um, www.mygfguide.com. And Natalie? <laughs> Save. That's what I'm here on Instagram, Kids Celiac Dietitian, and my website is the same, and also on Facebook as well. So, but all you know, pop me a message. I'm always happy to answer people's messages if I can. Great. Yeah, yeah. and I'm Sarah on the Gluten Free Blogger at GF Blogger. Um, and yeah, thank you so much, everybody, for joining in, and thank you, you guys. You have been amazing, so helpful, and um, yeah, let's make this Celiac Awareness Week awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks everyone um, for listening. Okay. Let's keep going. Bye. Guys, I'll speak to you soon. Bye. 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 Bye.